Thank you. Thanks so much. <coughs> so, um, can you hear me okay? Can you hear me okay in the mic? All right. So, <coughs> thank you very, very much for the kind invitation. I'm really pleased to be here. Um, what I'm going to do uh, today, so you've seen the title, Otherwise Engaged um, Social Media from Vanity Metrics to Critical Analytics. It's also the title of a, of a recently published paper. So this particular um, subject matter I have uh, now um, written out. So um, if you're interested, you can also have a look at that. Um, so what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to do two things. Um, I'm going to talk about first uh, sort of an overall kind of general critique of social media. Um, and in particular, uh, I'll talk about how social media has been studied as being predominantly a site for the presentation of self. Uh, and subsequently, um, social media as a site for the presentation of, of self um, have had uh, some metrics associated with it. And, um, and these are oftentimes called vanity metrics. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to discuss a, an overall critique of social media as, in some sense, producing vanity metrics. And then I'm going to provide an alternative. Um, first, I'm going to give you a, a short history of the uh, study of social media from the study of the self uh, to the study of social causes, and then introduce a new metrics project, uh, which I call critical analytics. And it's a, it's a general project. It's also an invitation for people from web science and beyond to perhaps shift their attention when doing metrics to, a, to a, a, another kind of metric. So another kind of metrics is, is possible. So this is, uh, this is largely the, uh, the argument. So <clears throat> what I want to um, start off with uh, is the idea of what kind of state we're in when we're using social media. Now, it's going to sound oxymoronic, but the state that we're in, the dominant state of engagement whilst on social media is arguably distraction. So we are distracted. Um, and there have been a number of um, terms that have been developed over the years. And I'm just going to highlight three of them that I think are, are quite interesting and, and provocative. Um, the first one is called uh, flickering man. And flickering man um, is a term that was developed by Nicholas Carr, the American uh, cultural critic. And writing in 2007 uh, in a blog post uh, that, is, um, uh, that seeded his book, uh, The Shallows, uh, he writes, contemplative man, the fellow who came to understand the world sentence by sentence, paragraph by paragraph, is a goner. He's being succeeded by flickering man, the, man, the fellow who darts from link to link, conjuring the world out of continually refreshed arrays of isolate pixels. Now, Carr was talking uh, at that point about Google, uh, but um, Clive Thompson, a year later, uh, called the current state of the social media user as being one uh, interested in ambient awareness. So ambient, amb ambient awareness is a, is a term also from computer-related uh, design circles. Um, but it refers uh, to this uh, idea of constant up-to-the-minute updates on what other people are doing. Um, uh, Ito referred to this as remote intimacy, the idea of also the sort of privatization of, uh, of, of public space. We are connected to others ambiently uh, and remotely uh, and thereby uh, distracted. Um, the third one is the, the notion um, that Linda Stone developed uh, called continuous partial attention. Uh, continuous partial attention uh, to Stone uh, is defined as an artificial sense of constant crisis, so as not to miss anything. A new condition because it is neither synchronous nor asynchronous communication. We're always in semi-sync mode. Uh, and she was in particular um, talking about mobile phone use, so, so Carr talking about Google and, the, in some sense, the cognitive effects thereof. Thompson um, talking about Twitter, in particular, um, and the interpersonal effects of distraction. And Stone um, talking about largely mobile phone use and social media on mobile phone, uh, talking about uh, uh, 
uh, the distraction in a, in a work sense. So we're distracted in, in sort of at least uh, three, three senses, at least according to these terms. Now, one of the projects that has been a reaction to this sort of distracted mode of engagement um, is the uh, project which you could describe as the sort of encalming technology movement. Um, the encalming technology movement um, started uh, with uh, Weiser and Brown in, uh, that should actually read 1996, um, when um, they uh, were quoted as saying the following, uh, information technology is more often the enemy of calm. This is 1996. Pagers, cell phones, news services, the World Wide Web, email, TV, and radio bombard us frenetically. Now, of course, these days on the interface, uh, these are dialogue boxes, pop-up boxes, push notifications, alarms, uh, and updates. And so what the project uh, that is currently uh, ongoing is, uh, is to encalm the interface. Uh, relatedly, there are a number of projects to try to demetrify um, the interface. And, and Benjamin Grosser, uh, who published a, a quite a well-known article in Computational Culture in 2014, um, came up with the Facebook demetricator. Um, so what he's doing is he's removing uh, the red, uh, well, removing the red badges, removing the numbers from the interface. I think it was about three weeks ago. Now he came out with a, a Twitter demetricator as well, uh, which was recently uh, written up. Uh, a review of it was written up in the New Yorker, which you can which you can read about. Um, so the idea of both, uh, well, first the encalming movement, but also the demetrification movement, um, is is to, in, in some ways, uh, change change the interface. So this is one one reaction. And I want to get into the, uh, another reaction, and this is the, the project that I want to introduce to you today of, of critical analytics. But before I get there, um, first I want to give you a sense of how social media is, uh, is oftentimes critiqued and how social media is oftentimes thought of to be valued. Um, so uh, how is social media normally thought of? So what is its purpose and what is its value? Um, arguably, um, its purpose um, according to uh, a New York Times author, uh, Wortham, um, is to uh, be boastful, is to show your success, is to, uh, is, is to perform on the front stage. Uh, you present yourself as a, as a successful one. Secondly, uh, is this idea of networking. It's a particular type of networking um, that you're s meant to do on, on, on social media. Uh, people refer to it as productive networking, and it goes back to the distinction uh, that was made by Dana Boyd and others uh, in 2007 <coughs> of the difference between social network sites and social networking sites. So social network sites would reflect your existing social network, whereas social networking sites would be the sort of making, making social network sites into something productive, into a sort of uh, a kind of neoliberal project where your friends that you link to, you link to them um, in order to uh, uh, create some utility f uh, from them. The third idea of social media, and this comes from social media managers, uh, it comes from uh, brand agencies, it comes from marketing, um, is, is, that, is, is the idea of in social media you have what could be referred to as um, uh, future consumers. Uh, so you need to plant and seed uh, particular products in order uh, for uh, them to circulate and ultimately be consumed. So put together these three ideas of social media, presentation of self and social media as presenting success theater, productive social networking, and consumer futurism, uh, gives it its value. Uh, and its value um, are oftentimes rendered into scores. So you will be familiar perhaps with the cloud scores, there was also one that was called the cred score. Th this idea of, uh, of counting um, uh, the numbers uh, of, of, in some sense, how well you are doing online. Um, so, so this also is performative. Uh, so it drives uh, what one does online. And what one does online arguably um, are, uh, are, are at least uh, uh, these sorts of things that I talked about before. Um, success theater, productive networking, etc. 
Um, but then the, its valuation are according to these, at least these three. So the idea of being or becoming a celebrity. Um, so it's very well known, the work, on, especially on Instagram, but also elsewhere, of, of the rise of the micro-celebrity, the rise of treating, treating your friends uh, as a fan base, um, and, so, and, and then performing for them as if they were fans. Um, so celebrity, um, Daniel Borston, the former um, American Librarian of Congress, defines celebrity as the capacity, or the, the so being well known for being well known. Uh, and he contrasted that with greatness. So greatness is something quite different from celebrity. Uh, and the second one uh, is, and this is the term that is oftentimes used nowadays, and people are kind of ad ad adopting it almost uncritically, is the notion of being or wanting to be an influencer or, or identifying others as influencers. Now influence, um, in this particular sense, oftentimes is in, in fact a, as, a, as a network measure. So it's, it's, it's a sort of betweenness measure. Uh, between the centrality measure. So, so what one, when one is an influencer, one is strategically in between. Uh, and one also would like to be identified as such because, uh, because th this is also a person who could be seeded with, with, uh, with products that would then um, circulate and become more well known. The third one is the idea of a trend. Um, so this is also something that's identifiable and that makes social media uh, uh, valuable. Um, there are trends, and of course there's trending. Trending topics is, is, a, is a sort of quite well-known uh, metric from, from Twitter. Um, a trend uh, I would define as sort of rising relative novelty, and it's, it's resulted in a, in a sort of small kind of industry. This is the consumer futurism uh, industry of cool hunting. And so what one is doing is one is trying to identify trends um, and also um, show that social media is the site to identify them. Um, so this is, how, this is generally speaking uh, the idea of how social media, if it is a network f uh, uh, for the presentation of self, is valued. Um, <clears throat> so what I would like to do uh, is uh, think about uh, a, a different kind of way of considering social media, and also thinking about a very, very different kind of way of measuring it. Um, so, so I would like to, to sort of invite us collectively to think about whether we can move beyond uh, vanity metrics uh, and think about social media as, as something, something quite, quite different. And so the first step in this argument uh, is, to, is to shift uh, in the study of social media, from the study of the presentation of self to the study of, of social causes, social issues, mobilization of publics. Um, and I think if you look at the, the way research has evolved over the last sort of five, seven, eight years uh, on the different social media platforms, I think that this shift is already occurring. So I think this shift is already occurring, and I'm going to talk a little bit about Twitter. Facebook and Instagram, but I think it's also occurring on other platforms as well. So, so scholars are not only thinking about um, these platforms as being platforms for the presentation of self and therefore for the, uh, study, for the study and creation of vanity metrics, but also for the study of the mobilization of publics around, around social issues and social causes. So I want to talk about each of these uh, platforms uh, very, very briefly, and give you a sort of really quick periodization of, of their study. So Twitter, I think, started off as being considered uh, banal. Um, it was uh, even studied as a, as, a, as a kind of what I had for lunch medium. Um, and this was, this was, in fact, the Jack Dorsey's medium. This is the what are you doing. This was the slogan at the beginning of, of Twitter. This is Jack Dorsey's original Twitter sketch. You can still find it on his Flickr account. Um, and you can see that Twitter was conceived of as being something for young sort of San Franciscan urbanites. Um, if you see here, uh, there are two default settings about your status. You're either in bed or going to the park. Um, and so this, this, is, this is Twitter um, for sort of ambient friend following, for phatic communication. Uh, for uh, telling uh, each other uh, what one had for lunch. 
Something happened, um, something quite concrete happened uh, in, in 2009, which sort of rather overnight um, turned Twitter into uh, a kind of de debanalized or a, a kind of serious um, uh, medium, which also corresponded with their changing of their slogan to what's happening. And this was the Iran's uh, so-called Twitter revolution and the uh, trending of the Iran election hashtag, uh, which was the second most used hashtag in, in 2009, according to Twitter. Um, and, this, and this particular idea of Twitter now as something quite different from the, what I had a, for lunch medium, suddenly it was a revolutionary medium. It was a medium um, which uh, played some form of role in the Arab Spring. It was a medium uh, to be uh, uh, studied in a particular way uh, as an event-following medium. So, uh, and the techniques uh, emerged to do rem remote event analysis, uh, and, and you could also study the distribution, the, in in the intensity as well as the distribution of concern as in this uh, Je suis uh, uh, Charlie uh, example. Um, I, w I also wanted to mention, th uh, sorry that I'm going to go back here, but I, w I want wanted to mention that th this sort of Twitter 3 um, emerged, I think arguably um, after all the debunking of the sort of Twitter revolution took place, uh, but, but Twitter 3 it, uh, also coincided with, in some ways, the co-modification, the coming to the, to the stock market of Twitter, uh, where, where uh, Twitter became a, also a sort of data sales uh, platform in some sense. Uh, and, but it also became this kind of generic research tool where you can study uh, most anything, and with the examples being um, elections, uh, stock, uh, stock movements, uh, celebrity awards. So Twitter became a sort of generic data set. So I'm not saying that this is a, uh, that one era ended and another one began. This is all transhistorical. But currently, Twitter is being used uh, for the study of, uh, of, um, of many, many different uh, social phenomena. I think this, this trend, I mean, uh, and we can talk about Cambridge Analytica uh, as well, uh, if you like. But I think this trend also um, has taken place in Facebook studies. So Facebook, I think, initially uh, was a, a site where one was interested in the study of, uh, of, of profiles. Um, so what are, how are people presenting themselves, what are their interests, uh, and, and, uh, and also tastes and ties, so classic um, social network analysis uh, where one looks at a, uh, at a, at a clique of friends and uh, also over time to see whether or not they, ha they share the same interests. Um, and this is where I think we had the first, uh, and I, we're about to have the second, but I think we had the first ethic, ethical turn. Um, in social media studies after this particular piece of work came out uh, by uh, Harvard uh, researchers um, who, who did a taste and ties research. Um, and um, the, uh, the, the data were anonymized uh, in the sense of the, um, the, the names were taken away, but the actual content of the posts were, were part of the study. And some researchers, Michael Zimmer, uh, in particular at the University of Wisconsin at Milwaukee, looked up, queried uh, for the text, and immediately found out uh, who were the subjects. Uh, there was uh, there was the uh, Harvard class of uh, of 2008, Harvard College class of 2008, and from that moment on, um, I think things started to shift uh, in in a particular direction. Um, and that direction is the, the gradual ending of the possibility of doing tastes and ties research through the Facebook API, uh, which, which was uh, uh, shut off in, um, uh, with version 2 in 2015, uh, and, and moving to the study of pages and groups. Um, and so with the study of pages and groups came with it also the study of moving from, from the study of the presentation of self and individuals and, 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 and uh, how they network um, to, uh, to causes, I would argue, and to social movements. And I think one of the first examples was, of course, the study of this particular page, um, which uh, was a part of the uh, Egyptian revolution of 2011. We are all Khaled Said. 
Uh, so this was one of the sort of quite, quite celebrated pages uh, worthy, worthy of study. Um, a lot of work has been done on doing page networks. So pages in, can like other pages. And so this is a, some work that we did on interliked page analysis of, uh, of extremists in Europe. Um, and and uh, what one then subsequently can do is look at uh, engagement in a different way. So it's not about um, how well one is doing uh, online, but rather, and I should warn you that some of these are a little bit nasty, these images, but which content animates the, the far right? Uh, so this is the most engaged with content analysis. So now the, the metrics are being put to a very, very different use. Um, so it's, these, are not, these are obviously not vanity metrics any longer. Uh, now I think Instagram, Instagram is interesting um, because it is a, it's, the, it's, it's the platform uh, that's, that's most associated with selfie culture and the, the studies of, of selfies and, and selfie culture. Um, and this particular work, uh, or this particular idea, was built in from the beginning. So this is the, the very first Instagram photo uh, uh, posted by uh, Kevin Systrom. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a kind of family selfie. It, that's, that's his dog, and that's his girlfriend's foot. Um, and uh, this particular idea of, of, of studying selfies um, is uh, built into the quite elaborate research projects. I mean, this one is Selfie City. This is by Lev Manovich. Um, and they took, they queried the selfie hashtag and the geo coordinates in five cities uh, Rio, Berlin, Moscow, um, I forget the other ones. And, and, then, and, then, and then analyzed the sort of formal character. He's, an, he's sort of an art historian. He analyzed the formal characteristics of the, of the, of the selfies and um, then derived kind of city mood sentiment. So, so it turned out that the, the folks, in, it's actually Sao Paulo, the folks in Sao Paulo is, have you know, quite light, their mood is light, and whereas in Moscow, their mood is dark. Um, but arguably, um, we, um, since a couple of years now, uh, this, even the study of Instagram is beginning to evolve. And, and this is also what Systrom uh, has stated before that, um, he, that, that they would like Instagram to be a bit more like Twitter, in the sense of more serious, uh, even though Instagram is, has a user base that's uh, much greater. Um, I think 900 million at the moment or something, and Twitter is like 235 million. But nevertheless, um, he uh, thinks that, that um, it could be a news-following medium, an event-following medium, rather than, a, than primarily a selfie medium, especially because of the power of, of images. And indeed, um, I think that there are increasingly studies which are looking at Instagram not from the point of view of selfie culture, but more, again, studying causes and issues, um, and using such notions of, uh, as antagonistic hashtags and, and hashtag publics. Uh, and for example, the, the, uh, uh, the divide between uh, Black Lives Matter versus Blue Lives Matter and things like this. Um, so, so if if you take along, uh, have come along with me with this argument that there is a palpable shift, or at least there is a parallel track in the study of social media um, uh, that is different from the presentation of self, and which um, is now taking social media uh, seriously as the site uh, of um, the mobilization of publics around, around social issues and social causes for good or for ill. Um, then perhaps another metrics is possible. And what I would like to propose is a, is a kind of methodological move uh, within um, uh, the, the study of, of, of social networking uh, sites or the networks therein. Um, and instead of um, uh, studying uh, using a big data approach, so getting it all uh, and then drilling in, um, to instead uh, locate uh, or demarcate issue networks uh, within uh, social media platforms, and then use them as your uh, means by which to develop metrics of uh, new metrics for, of engagement. 
Uh, so instead of uh, thinking of the uh, social media platforms as social networks, to think of them perhaps even more productively uh, as issue networks. And if we do that, uh, then uh, we can develop uh, new metrics. So what I would like to do um, is give you examples of some uh, metrics, and, and these are conceptual ones. I, I will actually give you uh, uh, actual sort of miniature cases. But before I do that, I, I'd like to say that, that I am not alone uh, in, this, uh, in this endeavor. So there's, there is other work uh, currently that are looking into um, al alternative metrics. Um, so the work by, by Dean Freelon, for example, of the University of North Carolina, um, he recently published a paper using Charles Tilley's uh, notion of social movement power, um, which, uh, which is constituted by four elements, um, uh, worthiness, unity, numbers, and commitment, and operationalized at least the last three of those uh, into uh, metrics, so social movement uh, power metrics. Uh, also David Karpf, um, where is he at the moment? I think American University. Uh, also recently has published a book um, on, on um, what does he call it, activist metrics. Uh, and these are um, largely techniques from marketing uh, whereby different NGOs will test uh, their messages. Uh, so in both these cases, these are in some ways translations of either existing network metrics into social movement ones, or uh, sort of marketing techniques uh, transferring them into, uh, into n the non-governmental space, whereas I'm going to come at it a little bit more conceptually uh, and talk uh, um, about uh, some notions that come more from, let's say, political theory and then translate them uh, into different ways that we can do metrics. Um, and these are the five of them. The slide's been up here, uh, so you've seen them. Uh, dominant voice, uh, concern, uh, commitment, positioning, and alignment. And, and I'll, I'll just, I'll just uh, go through these individually uh, very, very briefly and then conclude. So the, the notion of, of dominant voice uh, that I'm using is Foucauldian uh, in the sense of um, the um, 1972 uh, lecture where it talks about the, the, the idea of the cutting down of speaking subjects. So how are subjects marginalized? Um, well, they're not, they're not, uh, they are marginalized by <laughs> not only not giving them voice, but also by, in some ways, shouting over them. Um, and so this, this idea um, that uh, uh, one can take a, an issue space, an issue network, and then study it for dominant voice would be a critical analytic. Um, and it's critical in a number of ways, which I'll get to in, by, uh, in the conclusion. But I just want to give you, a, give you an, an example. So, so the idea is here um, to uh, demarcate an authoritative space and then, and then look at uh, the, the dominant voice. And this particular example comes from um, uh, US newspapers. Uh, this is in, uh, in 2011, I did this project where we looked at where in the news is uh, HIV vaccine uh, discussed. And this is a sort of normalized statistical. Um, and what we found was that by far the, the, the platform for the discussion of the HIV vaccine in the news was the business section. And this word here, is, this says health. Um, so, you, you, so I understand uh, quite quickly the idea of, of um, uh, at least in this particular example, of, of uh, what is the discourse that's dominating the discussion of a particular um, issue. The second one is concern. Um, and this comes from the work of Bruno Latour, uh, in particular his work on discussing what constitutes sort of matters of concern. And if we were to boil it down into a definition of what is concern, concern to Latour is the idea of, of the redirection of attention by publics. So 
um, whether we're distracted or whether we're, uh, we are attending else to something elsewhere, uh, when we are concerned, we redirect attention. And arguably, um, this is um, uh, quite easily measurable uh, and metrified. Um, so what we did um, uh, a few years ago is we looked at um, a sort of broad range of non-governmental organization types uh, and asked which, which part of the NGO world is concerned uh, with Fukushima. Um, this was the uh, uh, disaster at the, uh, at the nuclear power plant uh, in Fukushima uh, because of the tsunami in 2013. And this is one example of the output. Um, so we found um, that environmental NGOs uh, were uh, endlessly discussing Fukushima, uh, whereas the species NGOs were not. Uh, so in this particular example, uh, this was largely uh, the, uh, Greenpeace. Well, this was the Greenpeace was the leading organization, and WWF was the leading organization for species. Uh, so this is critical. Uh, obviously, of, of so to whom is this issue a matter of concern, and why is it not a matter of concern to species uh, NGOs? Um, the third um, critical analytic um, is the notion of uh, commitment. Uh, so, commitment here is defined as the longevity or persistence of concern. So, it's concern over time. Um, and for this, kind of conceptually, I refer to Suleiman's uh, distinction between a uh, consumer and a citizen. So a consumer, uh, if you're a consumer, uh, you can go in and out of uh, any uh, issue space um, and uh, consume it and leave. Uh, whereas if you're a citizen, a member of a community, uh, you can't just leave. Uh, and similarly, one can sort of think about uh, uh, measuring uh, whether or not, measuring short-termism, measuring the extent to which uh, particular organizations or particular individuals or what have you uh, uh, persist with their concerns or whether they come in and out of spaces uh, when it's convenient for them. And so the example that I want to give to you is from Greenpeace. Um, this is extremely simple, and it's extremely simple on purpose. Um, so, so this is, um, um, does Greenpeace uh, campaign for the same issues year on year? Or does it come in and out of issue spaces? So Greenpeace is oftentimes kind of accused of, of pulling media stunts and being sort of like consumerist in that sense. But what we found um, is that they're remarkably consistent over time uh, in, their, uh, in their commitment to particular issues. And we did this work by looking at using the Wayback Machine of the Internet Archive and, and looking at the, uh, their campaigning behavior over time. So, so using, using web data uh, for, uh, for the study of, uh, of commitment. Um, the fourth one. Uh, that I'd like to put forward, critical analytic, is the notion of positioning. Um, and positioning here is, is uh, defined as the purposive uh, use or deployment of a, of a keyword. <coughs> so um, are you using the word blood diamonds, or are you using the word conflict minerals? Uh, and, and, uh, so are, and, and being aware of which, which terms uh, you use, you're thereby uh, positioning yourself or taking a position. Um, and the, uh, the theoretical uh, framework uh, that I would like to attach to this idea is um, uh, Bruno Latour and Madalena Krisch's idea of a program and an anti-program. Uh, so they talk about, uh, as I mentioned before, sort of like Black Lives Matter versus Blue Lives Matter. So this is the, the police actually matter. Um, so the program and the anti-program, then positioning yourself as part of one or, or the other. Um, and I just want to give you a, an example of this um, from the 
just after the U.S. Supreme Court ruling uh, in favor of same-sex marriage, uh, immediately uh, there were celebrations uh, with the hashtag love wins and celebrate pride and things like this. Uh, and then sh very shortly thereafter came the antagonistic hashtag, love loses, uh, Jesus wins, uh, etc. Uh, and, and this kind of program and anti-program, so who is, who is positioning themselves uh, with the one or the other? There's also the third one, uh, which is called efforts at neutrality. Uh, this is oftentimes what journalists do. Um, the, the, they're very conscious that the, there are style guides, of course, for the BBC and the Guardian, et cetera. Uh, and, and they know not to use side-taking words. So those are, those are purposive efforts at uh, neutrality. They're, not new, they're in, in itself a positioning move. Right? It's not, they're not being neutral. They're positioning themselves as, as neutral. Um, of course, on Instagram, uh, there's uh, also filter activism. Uh, so one can look at the extent to, w one, one can take as an activity measure in the development of a metric, uh, filter activism. Um, and of course, on Instagram, there's also all of the posts are geotagged. Uh, so you can also look at, so you can geolocate hate, so to speak, to make it dramatic. Okay, the last one um, is alignment as a, as a critical analytic. Uh, and this is um, taken from the work of Walter Lippmann, the sort of famous American uh, journalist uh, who uh, was the first to sort of inspired Chomsky, who was the first to sort of write about the manufacture of public opinion. Um, and uh, what he called for in his critique of the instruments that manufactured public opinion, what he called for were coarse instruments to uh, be able to figure out signs of where sympathy lies. Um, and so I would argue that alignment is a means by which one can study signs of where uh, sympathy lies. Um, and it is um, um, uh, the company that keywords, the company that keywords keep. So in the previous one, it was, it was individual positioning. This is now group positioning. And the example that I'm giving you um, is from the UN Security Council debate around the uh, thing between the Israel and the Palestinian territories and, 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 and uh, how it's called and by whom. And then thereby which alignments uh, can be uh, drawn up or shown to see where uh, sympathies lie. Um, and here, um, so the, the official term on the Israeli side is security fence, and on the Palestinian side is apartheid wall. Uh, and then you'll notice, for example, Israel uh, using security fence, and, and only Germany uh, showing uh, sort of terminological alignment, whereas uh, other uh, countries use uh, quite different terms, some more radical than others. And you could see particular terms <coughs> um, emerging. Uh, which sh show uh, multiple uh, alignments and, and thereby perhaps examples of, of, uh, of, of different countries coming to terms, uh, if you will, uh, separation wall or, uh, or, just, or just wall, because separation is oftentimes a term, uh, adjective used by the Palestinians as the real purpose of the wall. Okay, so um, in conclusion, um, I just want to summarize the argument. So, so, so oftentimes, um, uh, social media are studied as a site for the presentation of self. Uh, and this particular assumption that that is what social media are for um, have led to um, the development of a, of a variety of metrics, which uh, uh, are oftentimes called vanity metrics. And vanity metrics is a, is a critical term. It's not from me. It's, it's from, uh, it's from, actually it's from business studies it's sort of within marketing it's, itself. Uh, it's oftentimes used as sort of admonition um, to, uh, to various companies to not only follow vanity metrics and not only follow these sort of very simplistic countings because you don't, will not necessarily know what's really happening. Um, so I provided a kind of critique of why uh, 
uh, it is oftentimes thought social media have value because of particular assumptions about its, its purpose. Um, and try to instead talk about thinking about changing the definition or the ontology, if you will, of what a, what a social networking site or what social media are, and then introducing a new epistemology. So, so saying that we can actually demarcate and study issue networks uh, within, still within social media, and then develop new metrics uh, of, uh, for, uh, for engagement that are, that are productive. Now, these metrics, which I call critical analytics, are critical on a number of levels. Uh, first, they kind of build in a critique of social media that I outlined before. But also, they're reflexive in the sense that they put on display to NGOs and, and others uh, what, it is that, uh, what it is that they're in some ways doing. Are you committed? Uh, who are you aligned with, uh, et cetera? So they're also critical on, on that level. And so I would um, uh, generally like to um, invite the web science community and beyond uh, to join me in the critical analytics uh, project. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Richard. A very far reaching and provocative talk, and I, one that I absolutely know um, because I know the audience is going to try and talk to as many of them. So I'll open it up for questions. Thank you very much for this wonderful talk. Um, I'm a social movement researcher. Ah. And um, so um, the, um, the list that you presented was brilliant uh, and resonated so well with what I know from social movement studies, which is based on newspaper analysis. Right. So obviously, there are different affordances in terms of print media and electronic media. Um, but there is a lot of resonance, and um, I thought I'd bring in a couple of um, terms used in these traditional analysis, like standing and framing. Um, What's the first one? Standing? Standing, mm -hmm. and I think that, um, that uh, relates to your dominant voice, and um, framing yeah. in terms of the alignment. Mm -hmm. And that has been, for example, used to analyze abortion discourse. Yeah. Um, and, um, and so I think it would be really useful to combine this older literature mm. with this approach, because it would give it more depth. And um, I would also like to add um, forms of repression, repression, like silence and ridicule, which mm. I think would also be very useful to explore in this context. And the last thing that I wanted to say is I wanted to bring it back to what you said earlier in the morning when you were talking about the platform cooperation. Because in 1999, um, indie media was formed uh, yes. as alternative forms of activism. Yes. Yeah? And so that is a form of platform cooperation, which was then displaced by Facebook. So I think that. In social movement studies, there is already a lot of awareness of these forms, so which would not quite fit with this distinction with Twitter one and plus and Facebook one because it also it has been seen that way. And so I think it would be just and in social movement studies, I think there is a lot of naivete about um, social media. So I think that bringing that together would give so much depth. Thank you very, very much. Yeah. Um, I mean, just what, uh, because I was going to say something about framing, <clears throat> not about standing, but I, I think that that's also extremely useful. But I mean, like traditionally, um, framing analysis is, is a news critique, right? No. no okay. Not, not, not so, so it's so. I mean, if you look at Robert Entman and others, but so 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 it's 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 comparing. You know, different, different, oftentimes, different kinds of newspapers, and then, and then, and then, what are the frames that they use for the same story? So this, this is, this is how oftentimes, how I've studied. For, I mean, of course, the, there's more to it than that, but, um, and we could apply that type of thing, that kind of frame analysis, to, to, to social media platforms. But, 
but um, but I don't know if that's that's the kind of platform critique that we would like to do. I think there's a different kind of platform critique that we could do that's different from frame analysis. But if we move to the actors themselves, um, and which frames and which competing frames, and, and um, so so that, you know, in, in presidential campaigns or the rest, people using you know the freedom fighters versus guerrilla, you know, like using the using uh, different different loaded terms for the same same thing. So so I, I agree, and and in that sense, um, framing analysis w is similar. Uh, but I, I, I don't use the term on purpose because I'm not doing a news critique. Well, or anyway, this is what this is my response. <laughs> you might not agree. <laughs> Yeah. I just kind of had that thought. Thank you for that question. Yeah, because I, I really wanted to talk about that at some point. So this is a good, good moment. Um, so, so uh, the the one there are a couple of things I wanted to say about it. But one of the things is that um, uh, y you s you saw um, this 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 Facebook one and Facebook two. So the, the Cambridge Analytica data was gathered during the Facebook One era, uh, before the change to API 2.0, which which then uh, cut off one's access to um, like, like your own uh, profile information as well as your friends and their likes and and their profile information. So you used to be able to grab that that data. Um, so, so in some sense, uh, Facebook's response to saying this is not a data breach um, is in technically you know, correct uh, because that that data was 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 available then. And so, it, so the the we're, we're actually talking about this over, over the, the, that that media frame of stolen data, passwords, personal. It doesn't really apply in this case. It was it was a, it was. A <coughs> That Facebook data was was available part of the part of what was available on the platform. Um, so, but but then more poignantly, <laughs> right? So, um, uh, that's why I added in parenthetically at one point for good or for ill, uh, because uh, the, what what um, uh, what in some sense Cam Cambridge Analytica were doing uh, was doing uh, this kind of work. Um, so, uh, but I, I don't know if I would call it critical analytics, <clears throat> but they were doing you know issue analytics in some ways. So, <clears throat> so what needs to be added um, is that is that you know th this sort of stuff is you know is is can be used in a variety of ways. Um, and so then, what are the implications of that? Uh, I think is the the next question. Um, I, you know, I I oftentimes was asked this question, like like. Um, uh, years ago, when when I was doing like uh, like hyperlink mapping, so we were showing um, you know which so like like Greenpeace critically linked to Shell, but Shell didn't link back. Um, so what did, you know, and and then making these large maps, you know, positioning all these uh, organizations in a particular issue space, and people are always like, well, can't that be used? Strategically by the other side, um, and uh, and then therefore, um, w you know, what are the, what are, what are you doing normatively here? So so what's what uh, uh, should you um, you know take active measures to um, uh, in in the sense of who you make your software available to, and in fact we did. Um, so you know we added sort of entire user management system and. And, and in some ways, you know, with, with some questions, we sort of vetted the, the, the users. And, um, and that sort of thing has gone away a lot. I mean, um, uh, the, the vetting of users of these sorts of, so I think that that's one implication uh, for us. Um, <coughs> uh, I mean, I don't know if people would agree with that, but, um, 
But, uh, but, uh, but another implication, and we, we had a, a longer session the, the, this morning about um, um, what are the dominant critiques now of social media research uh, n now that we're in the state we're in. And, and um, I think, I, I think um, what, what, what some of the implications for our work are that, that social media companies, um, um, they're already treating scientists in some ways as, as a kind of, uh, as the same as marketing companies. You know, the, 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 the rate limits are the same. It's like we don't have special access. Um, but I think that it's going to be harder now um, so Facebook announced this this morning or yesterday that that they're now going to like like heavily review you know the native apps you know we have apps built into Facebook that are pulling uh, pulling data all, all the all the time and and you know if, if Facebook goes the same route as Instagram which just cut off researcher access uh, last year um, that and only grants access to you know like like so use cases they understand marketing you know, like, I, I think um, I think we our measure our means of measure uh, will be cut off, and I I, um, I don't think I don't think we should because of this incident, and and I don't think we should be leaving the platforms, um, uh, but I think we should be um, uh, demanding better access. And the other thing is is that the, sorry, just one more one more point, um, is that in October of um, 2017, when it became known what the what the actual reach of the Russian disinformation pages on Facebook was, like how many interactions, um, the work done by Jonathan Albright at the Tau Center at Columbia. Once that became known and published, Facebook deleted that that data, took it out of Crown Tangle, um, and where is it? Uh, and uh, and and uh, when they did, when they when they testified before Congress um, two weeks later, and they and they they gave a list of 90 other um, Russian or Russian style uh, accounts, um, they had already they they listed them, uh, but they had already deleted the data. So so there's going to the, so increasingly we we we're also faced with data deletion, uh, which is another uh, and they control the archives. We talked about this stuff this morning. I'm sorry if this is, but they also control the archives. So, so CrowdTang, Twitter has it as GNIP, um, uh, and and so they they update the ar so if they delete an account, they update the archive, right? So there are a bunch of implications for for research. Um, it doesn't mean leaving the platforms now, uh, just to reemphasize that point, uh, but uh, 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 demanding more research access. Um, I think I think I think you're right. Um, I think mo I think most of the um, uh, so the so social movement measures, generally speaking, social movement power. That's about diversity, right? That's about a, a, a diverse mass. Um, but then if you talk about platform users, um, it, it, you know, there's, there are different demographics. Um, and and these, these, um, these particular um, metrics are in part drawn from platform use. So in that sense, I would agree with you. But on the other hand, um, have a kind of, in some ways, a social movement spirit to them. So... So therefore, try to uh, embrace diversity. One is how people use the platform might change over time. And then the 
third one is that what academics might be interested in mm. changes over time. And it seems to me that all of those things were in play. And I wonder if you have a sense at all of, of how you and your argument are weighting those different drivers. Oh, that's a really good question. How you might conceptualize the relationship between those drivers. Hmm. An even better part two. Um, <clears throat> So, so the, 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 the overall point of departure is the third one. And so it's, 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 so the, the, the history of the, uh, the study of the object, yeah. Um, and, and then from there, um, um, going to assumptions of use, uh, and then from there to how the platform sees itself. So, it's, so oftentimes when one studies this stuff, one would go in the other direction, right? But, but I'm coming from the... Re the Object of study and how it's been studied. That coming from there first. Um, <clears throat> so, so in some sense, I mean, this is now a weak answer because I haven't thought about this. But in some sense, that is the relationship. Um, it's it's um, it's 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 one of the it's it's one of how to productively order those three elements for an argument. Um, but 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 maybe more interestingly. Um, I think that the um, the the use uh, is something that um, that researchers the changes in use is something that researchers notice and and uh, and that and the changes in use are affected by how the platforms change and so this is this is in some sense the this is some sense the interaction and um, and so you see this time and again I mean not Instagram yet. Um, because there hasn't been an Instagram revolution, um, but but the the way in which uh, Twitter uh, as well as Facebook were in some sense implicated as objects of study in the Arab Spring and beyond um, uh, changed the way they were they oftentimes studied, um, uh, and those were uh, those those the uh, the use of um, for example Twitter and and the famous moment where. Where the State Department asked Twitter not to do maintenance on the platform because it was needed for revolution in Iran that night, you know, right? So it was also um, <laughs> true story, right? but it was also um, uh, so the, the the so how the platforms operate and also change. Um, um, so <clears throat> so I, I don't know exactly what the what the what the interplay is, but there. The, but there is obviously an interaction of the of those three things, and it was, and it was a really well formulated question. Actually, Julia, final question, then we'll have cake, more cake. Thank you very much. Uh, I really found your uh, critique of the market, the, the the concept of value, away from the market evidence. I spent a bit of time studying the concept of value within the marketing discipline, and it's remarkable how depth has changed over time within just. Oh, it's really interesting. Say that again. Whether you engage with that literature or how that's maybe informed what you're saying. Wow, that's a really that's a really good observation of yours. I would like to ask you some questions now, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so I, I yeah, I haven't, I haven't, I mean, uh, you know, like. I've read Marx, right? So, there's like, so it's, I've read the political economy literature, um, also some some critical brand studies, but not so much the marketing literature. Uh, um, but um, uh, um, what I, what I think is what I think is Im important to to point out is, um, um, as I said before, d uh, what I mean, you social. So there are different ideas about. Um, what a what a social networking site could be, and I think one one idea one. Um, so if you go back, you know to well, the, you know there could have been a, 
There could have been a gas fridge or an electric fridge, or there could have been an electric car. Or diesel. You know, if you go back, like the history of technology always has these examples of, of the, the, the competing technologies. In which, and so one could think about social media in some ways similarly, also with the indie media example. Um, and a particular model won, and it, it's not, it, wasn't, it didn't win naturally. <laughs> um, uh, um, so, and that, that model was, a, was one. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, it, so it, it, it won, and so the, the thing that won is what I was critiquing, right? So, so the particular understandings of, of what makes the user and use valuable. And, and it's because uh, because of <coughs> the, the 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 way one can present oneself well and then show it off to others in a sort of boastful or vain way, uh, and then count that. Uh, and so that 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 became. Um, but but now that um, I think that the I mean I'm not answering your question at all. <laughs> Sorry, but one of the last things that I'll say is that is that. As we now um, uh, are sort of in some ways moving outside of, of uh, being able to count, and this is also the Cambridge Analytical story, something, being able to count the individual and the individual's tastes and preferences, uh, because we have uh, upped the privacy settings and um, I, I, thi I think uh, we'll, we'll see new We'll see the dawn of new valuations, and I think quite soon. Um, that's one thing. Uh, and the other thing is is that, and I, we were talking about this briefly earlier, is that it's like, what's Facebook going to do now uh, in terms of how it sort of presents itself? Uh, and uh, and what I think will, what I think will happen, and I think it's already happening, is that is that Facebook um, will. Um, go the same route as Google did, and that is the route of personalization. So it will ask you to value sources. It will ask you to value people. And so what you then get in your feeds, you've co-authored. It's your fault, not ours. Um, so there you go. And thanks very much for the invitation.